In this lecture, we will be looking at some of the non-paranormal explanations for ghosts and hauntings. Many of these explanations focus on some of the unique aspects of human perception and cognition. At first, it may seem like such explanations take the fun and mystery out of paranormal phenomenon. But really, such phenomenon can teach us a great deal about how we perceive and understand the world around us. First, let's start with two real-life examples. During the 1976 investigation into the Amityville house, an automatic camera was set up to take infrared pictures on the second floor landing. This infamous picture was taken by the camera and has become known as the Ghost Boy photo. Some have claimed that this boy is one of the two DeFeo brothers who was killed by Ronald DeFeo on the night of November 13, 1974. In this second example, we'll take a look at a viral video. You may have seen this video already going around. It is sometimes said to be the screams of a woman who was murdered outside of this motel. On the first morning there, we plan to get up early, catch the sunrise, and hopefully spot some of the local wildlife. So our alarms were set for 5 a.m. At about 4.45 a.m., I was woken up by a loud banging on the door, followed by crying and shouting. I instantly jumped out of bed thinking the worst had happened. I opened the door to my mom in a state of panic saying, there's someone screaming, a woman screaming. There, clear as day, I could hear a woman screaming. It sounded like it was within 100 feet of us. Mom claimed it was happening for the last 30 minutes. We wanted to call the police but had no phone signal, no phones in the rooms, and we were the only people about. With this, his post contained a link to an unlisted video on YouTube that gives us a first-hand account at what he'd experienced. In it, we can hear the screaming that he's been asking about, and it's absolutely something that would halt me in my tracks if I were ever to hear this myself. Fairly unnerving, isn't it? Now let's back up and take a look at both of these examples with some more information. Considering the stories we have heard about the haunted home and knowing that two young boys were killed in this home, it is understandable to jump to the conclusion that this picture is in fact a picture of a ghost. But what if I showed you a picture of investigator Paul Bartz who was working at the house and wearing a shirt with the same pattern as this ghost boy? What if I told you that infrared film makes people's eyes glow just as we see? Now what if I told you that Bartz did confirm that it was him looking out the door while checking the camera setup? Now as for the screaming ghost, well let me just play you this. Sometimes we see what we expect we will see, or what we are encouraged to see. There are two general processes involved in sensation and perception, top-down and bottom-up. Top-down processing is perception that is driven by cognition. Our brains are wired to fill in the blanks so we can anticipate what will happen next. However, this sort of perception is heavily influenced by our expectations and prior knowledge. To put it simply, top-down processing is about getting from perception to meaning as quickly and as efficiently as possible. This has both positives as well as negatives. For the advantages, consider the amount of information around us. It's staggering. To process it all in its entirety all the time would be paralyzing. Top-down processing enables us to make less work on the cognitive path between perception and meaning making. Top-down processing helps us to understand and recognize patterns. As for the disadvantages, well, each and every perception we have is based on our past experiences. Our individual knowledge is both limited and prone to bias. Let's take a look at a non-spooky example. The Stroop effect is a classic of psychology. J. Ridley Stroop demonstrated how automatic the reading process can be. The task that he developed was simple 
Participants were given a list of 100 color words and had to name out loud the color in which the word was printed. For example, if the word red was printed in blue, the correct answer was blue. As control conditions, Stroop either gave participants a list of the same words printed in black, which they had to read aloud, or a grid of colored squares for which they had to name the color. Despite telling participants not to read the words themselves, the participants could not help themselves. When a color word was presented in a different ink, participants were much slower to name the ink because the automatic process of reading the word itself was getting in the way. This automatic process is a perfect example of how the efficiency of top-down processing can get us into trouble. People can recognize the word before even taking information in about the color, which makes it easier for them to recognize the word rather than think about the color. So with this in mind, let's talk about hauntings. Imagine a spooky performance theater. Now let's say we have brought 22 people to this theater and told half of them that this theater is haunted. To the other half, we tell them that the building is just under renovation. Now we ask these people to visit different areas of the theater by themselves. And then later, we have them fill out questionnaires about their experience. If the location was haunted, then we should expect to see no real difference in how the people responded. But what do you think would be the actual results of such an experiment? Well, psychologists Horan and Lang can tell you. They ran this study and found that those who were told the place was haunted had significantly more intense perceptual experiences than those who were told it was just being renovated. So how do beliefs affect our interpretation of an event? Well, in a 2015 study conducted by Dagnall et al., participants were taken on something of a virtual tour through a fictitious abandoned hospital. First, they were shown a slideshow of the hospital and told that either it had a history of ghostly activity or that it just had structural problems. Then they were taken on a silent black and white video tour of the hospital. Afterwards, they completed multiple measures assessing environmental perceptions and phenomenon, along with measures related to belief in the paranormal and other surveys. The results? The level of paranormal belief affected haunt-related ratings. Suggestion did not. Belief that the hospital was haunted mediated the relationship between paranormal belief and expectation of haunt-related phenomenon. In other words, Believing the hospital was haunted clarified the relationship between paranormal beliefs and expectations of what would be seen. This suggests that beliefs play a significant role in how we approach scenarios and how we perceive and interpret phenomenon. A great example of this is the infamous God Helmet. Persinger, the creator of the Helmet study, claims as many as 80% of participants perceive non-natural phenomenon. But what happens if you put the helmet on one of the world's most infamous atheist skeptics? Pretty much felt as though I was in total darkness um, with a helmet on my head and um, uh, pleasantly relaxed um, and occasionally feeling the sensations which I described as they occurred into the microphone. Um, but I would be hard put to it to swear that those were not things that could happen to me any time on a dark night. So at this point, we might ask ourselves, is there a difference in how believers think? Well, yes. Believers tend to exhibit a reduction in cognitive inhibition. Cognitive inhibition refers to the mental ability to tune out stimuli that is irrelevant to the task or process at hand. They also tend to demonstrate a more associational thinking style. Associative thinking is what allows for associations to form between seemingly unrelated ideas. Believers also tend to attribute more intentionality and mental states to neutral stimuli. This tendency is associated with an enhanced theory of mind. The theory of mind refers to the ability to attribute mental states to both ourselves and others. It is a critical stage of mental development. So what happens when you put these together? Well, you end up with a tendency for something known as apophenia. Take a look at the following picture. It was taken by the Viking 1 spacecraft in 1976 while snapping photos of the surface of Mars. Spooky, right? 
This image captured the public imagination for decades, even inspiring a truly terrible movie in the year 2000. But a funny thing happened. Space photography got a lot better after 1976, and we ended up getting some better shots of the face. Apophenia is the tendency to see meaningful patterns and randomness and make remote associations, and it's something which is previously established, believers are more prone to do. But keep in mind, apophenia is not limited to believers. Pareidolia is a type of apophenia, and it can also explain some supernatural phenomenon, most notably EVPs. One of the most common devices in a paranormal investigator's toolkit is the humble audio recorder. They use it to pick up EVPs or electronic voice phenomenons. It doesn't pluralize quite right when you spell it out. Anyhow, the idea is that you can hit record, ask questions to a room, and then hear vocal responses in the audio when you play it back. And that's totally true. It's just that those vocal responses aren't generated by ghosts, they're generated by your brain. Another way our brains can trick us is pareidolia, our tendency to find familiar patterns even where none exist. We've talked about this before in the context of seeing faces in rocks, or toast. That happens because our primate brains evolved to quickly recognize one another, and that ability comes with a side effect of also recognizing familiar forms in otherwise random patterns. Turns out this isn't just a visual thing. We're so keen on recognizing other humans that we often hear human voices that aren't really there. This is what's known as audio pareidolia, and it explains why you might hear a cryptic voice in radio static or someone whispering your name in the wind. Basically, when your brain attempts to make sense from nonsense, Static and amplified background noise are shaped into vague words. Add a little sprinkling of wishful thinking because you're trying to hear words from the other side and you end up with a full-blown ghost voicemail. And the power of suggestion can even alter what message you hear. As we explained when we talked about auditory illusions, there are a lot of factors that can affect how your brain interprets ambiguous sounds. Experiments from both white noise and human speech have demonstrated that if subjects are given context beforehand, their interpretation of a recording tends to match their preconceived expectations even if the provided context is deliberately incorrect. So if we were to play you something we recorded in the old sawmill across town at 3 a.m. the other night, your impression would be very different if we told you that it said, get out, than if we told you the message was eight cows. Still, in either case, the recording in question wasn't actually speech or words at all. It was just ambient noise. So let's review the points from this video. One top-down processing, while enormously beneficial to our sense-making abilities, is prone to errors of bias due to its efficiency. This can result in errors which can lead us to draw mistaken conclusions based on incomplete evidence. 2. Sometimes we see what we expect we will see. Context and beliefs can greatly influence how we perceive and interpret things. 3. Apophenia and pareidolia are two natural perceptual phenomenon which cause people to see meaning and patterns in randomness.